All right, if you are here, please type present in the chat. And are there any questions before we begin? I was just going to say the uh, that lab got way easier once we got Mininet all up in the running. It was went pretty smooth. So, yay! <laughs> yep. Sometimes setting up the system is the hardest thing to do. And once you have all the pieces, it's actually everything else is easy. All right. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So I was looking over my grade for the second lab. Yes. It wasn't a hundred percent and I'm not exactly sure what I did wrong. Is there any way that I could, who do I contact to get more detailed feedback to figure out what the hell I. Um, yeah. Um, you should email RTA Suraj. And if there's, if you guys aren't able to resolve it, then, um, look me into the conversation. Oh, no, that's fine. I don't expect a perfect grade. I mean, I just was trying to figure out what I did wrong. That's all. Yep. Anybody else? Um, all right, one question to you guys, um, just for my own clarity. Um, I've, I've been entertaining, signing um, a few drop requests for this course. Um, in the last week or so, and I wanted to kind of get a take um, what's going on with you guys. If if anyone knows why people are dropping right now, if there's anything I can do to um, help people stay in the course, just kind of inside. I mean, it's okay for people to drop. I just want to ask um, if there's anything that I'm missing or I don't know. Um, I can't speak for everyone else, but all of my concerns were more or less addressed many weeks ago. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, ever since the, the initial change that we did, I felt like this class has been really maintainable and manageable for myself. <clears throat> great. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think this is very reasonable, especially all the changes. Okay. Agreed, Sim. Okay. Any clue why people are dropping? Um, I would say, if anything, I could see how easy it would be to get behind um, if you put uh -huh. off a programming assignment or two uh, and then started to work on two or three program assignments at the same Once. time and kind of too far behind. And yeah. I think that would probably be my my biggest thing. If I didn't keep up with the programming assignments, I probably would have not been in a good position whatsoever right now. That's what I'm imagining. I All right. Um, well, if anyone if anyone is on the cusp of dropping, um, please reach out and talk to me about what's going on with you. Um, I mean, I'd like to keep people in the course if I can, but. If people aren't able to do the work, then well, that's just what it is. So, <clears throat> um, but if there's anything I can do, or if you just want to talk, I'm I'm happy to do it. Just let me know. All right. Well, good job to you guys for staying in. So that's good. <laughs> um, all right. Let's get into our lecture. Justin, you're uh, very aggressively Justin, you typing. Might want to oh, mute. Sorry. Mechanical keyboard problems. <laughs> Fancy. Uh, all right. So uh, we talked about Wi-Fi and cellular, but um, as it turns out, those aren't the only two wireless technologies out there. And so um, why do you guys think that might be? What are some of the gaps that Wi-Fi and cellular uh, does not meet? I would say it's extreme short range, low bandwidth communication. Probably why we had to invent something like Bluetooth and RFID. 
Yeah, short short range. Um, why would short range in itself be an advantage? I mean, Wi-Fi can work over short ranges. If you put, you know, your laptop to next to your access point, will still work. Yeah, but Wi-Fi's biggest strength is, if I remember correctly, its range. It's um by creating a different protocol that uses different frequencies. I would imagine that you avoid congestion. And avoid congestion. Yeah, there's something. There's there is something to the short range that has to do with congestion, right? <clears throat> if you think of being in a loud bar and people trying to talk to each other by yelling at the top of their lungs, you wouldn't be able to have many simultaneous conversations, right? And this goes back to the example of you guys trying to uh, kind of transmit data on the common channel. No one could really hear what was being transmitted very well. Um, but if you're in a bar and everybody just whispers into someone else's ear, um, you can have many, many conversations with quite good quality of service. Uh, right or quite understandable speech. So there is something about reducing power that allows more conversation to happen at the same time. Um, it also provides you with privacy, right? If you're whispering, your whisper is not going to carry very far, and so you can potentially transmit private information more securely. <clears throat> um, what about power? Why might Wi-Fi and cellular not be very good at conserving power? Well. <laughs> that that's it kind of answers itself by reducing the amount of power you use it means that you can put those these other standards in everything and anything true um but what is even more efficient than transmitting at low power not transmitting at all yeah that's true right so it's it, it, in many applications, there just isn't that much data to be sent or the data that needs to be sent is quite periodic. For example, a sensor reading that comes out once every minute, once every second, you know, whatever your interval is, <clears throat> you can basically spend a lot of time sleeping and only wake up to do the transmission. All right, so, so there are applications of protocols that uh, where it makes sense to specialize the protocol to... Uh, transmit less or transmit differently, right? In, in a way that Wi-Fi and cellular doesn't cover with, because those are really made for continuous transmissions, okay? So the first one of these, yeah, question? Nope, okay. Um, so first of these technologies is Bluetooth. We didn't talk about it yet, so here it comes. Um, interestingly enough, Bluetooth works in um, the same bandwidth as Wi-Fi in 2.4 gigahertz, right? So we don't have different bandwidth, we just have a different way of, of um, using it. And so um, it uses both time division multiplexing or time division multiple access. Um, you can kind of talk about these uh, as TDM, TDM or TDMA, um, where we have 625 microsecond time slots. So everything is divided into that. It's a synchronized transmission. Right? kind of like um, um, slotted aloha. And you have frequency division multiplexing where there are uh, this bandwidth is divided into 79 separate channels as opposed to um, 11 or 13, whatever, um, you know, depending on the country, uh, separate channels for Wi-Fi. Okay. So Bluetooth is basically a, um, you can think of it as a cable replacement uh, technology where it's really point to point. You want two devices to be able to talk to each other. Yeah. And um, the, way, the way this works, the way these channels are used is um, basically have an original signal that goes through a modulator and then you end up with a spread spectrum transmission. Um, I'll illustrate it in a second, but the basic idea is that over time you are hopping between uh, channels. So you don't keep a, a single frequency for transmission, but different packets, or basically not maybe not different packets, but different uh, parts of a packet are transmitted in these different time slots. And your single transmission might get uh, time slots that are spread out um, across the different channels. Okay. So the channels that you're going to use for transmission are um, governed by the pseudo-random generator that ends up 
looking up a frequency table and switching up your frequency um, on a particular schedule that is synchronized between the sender and the receiver. Okay. So <clears throat> the sender and receiver would agree on a seed. That seed would, would then generate a, a bit pattern. And then um, uh, different portions of the bit pattern are used to look up the frequency table. And then from there, you know that, OK, next uh, time slot is going to be transmitted at this fre frequency. And the time slot after that is going to be transmitted at this frequency. Okay. And so over time, your transmission might look like, OK, now we're transmitting this frequency, then we're transmitting this frequency, and so on and so forth, according to some sequence. So this technology was developed uh, by the military to prevent jamming. So um, what you can do is basically, if you don't want two people to communicate, you can jam a particular frequency by uh, issuing a high power transmission on that frequency. Um, it's basically two people trying to have a conversation and you, and you just screaming so that no one can hear <laughs> anybody but you, right? That's jamming. Now, if we have a wide enough uh, frequency band, it is difficult to jam all the different bands at once, okay? Um, if you want to put out a lot of power you need to, on a transmitter, you need to basically concentrate it in a particular band. If you're trying to uh, yell at, or, you know, or, or have a high power transmission at all the bands, you're gonna use a lot more power because you need to put the same amount of power into each frequency, which in aggregate is just a lot more, okay? So what um, the military figured out is that instead of picking one transmission, one frequency, and then sending all the data on it, they can hop between frequencies to make it difficult for a jammer to follow up, the, to follow the transmission and uh, figure out which frequency to jam in each particular time slot. Okay. Um, so this turns out to be quite resilient to interference as well. And so it has been used in, in Bluetooth where, for example, if there's a Wi-Fi transmission and one of the time slots gets clobbered by Wi-Fi transmission, well, that's okay. Um, we can use other time slots to actually transmit data in this random sequence. Okay. There are different flavors of Bluetooth uh, that basically vary by kind of the bandwidth that you can achieve and range. So uh, Bluetooth 3 is still quite popular. You have now Bluetooth Low Energy, which is also called Bluetooth 4, which gets you a little bit longer transmission. And then version 5, which is being standardized, um, uh, you end up with even more bandwidth and even more range. So this kind of follows the um, general evolution of, um, of wireless hardware. Okay? Um, the way Bluetooth networks are um, organized is in what they call piconets, where you have one master node, and you can have up to seven active devices that, are, that the master can communicate with. And there are also up to 255 park devices, um, which are registered with the master, but they're not transmitting at the time. So they can ask to be active by sending some, by basically activating themselves with the master. And if there's room in the active devices, they'll be ad admitted to the Piconet um, as an active device. And so- oh, I, oh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, so why, like, you, could, you say you can have seven active devices here. How come I can't connect like my phone to multiple Bluetooth speakers throughout my house? Like, if I'm trying to connect to like my Google Home yes. and another Bluetooth speaker that I might have or something like that. Right. It has to do with the mode of these devices. So your, your speakers uh, are going to act as a master device um, with its own Piconet. Okay. So your device, which is the phone, can connect to one Piconet or another um, at a time. Oh, I was thinking that it was opposite. Like my phone was the master and everything else was the slave. Nope. Okay, cool. That makes um, sense. Then. Yep. Um, Wait, so if the speaker's the master, then could you connect it to like three devices at the same time and get some really screwy results? 
You mean, could you have like three phones connected at the same time to the speaker? Yeah, all trying to play music at the same time. Um, well, that has to do with kind of protocol. Uh, I'll, I'll get into kind of how um, you can connect to, you know, you can set up a music stream. Uh, but basically, the master device can choose which data to uh, play out, right? From which device to play out data. Um, so, but what you do have, for example, I have a, I have a speaker that when I turn it on will announce the devices that are connected to. So it says connected to, you know, Mike's Android and connected to, you know, someone else's phone or whatever, right? Um, and so basically that's the master saying, oh, I can establish connections with these two devices, but then only one of them will play at the time. So in this network, if you do want to transmit data between um, two phones, you either need to set up one of them as the master and the other one pairs to it, or you can write an application at the master that does relaying of, of data between two phones, for example. Okay, so um, there are kind of layers to the Bluetooth protocol. It gets, it gets a little bit complicated, um, but basically you have kind of like the vanilla Bluetooth which provides just connectivity, but then the types of services that are provided by the different devices have also been standardized. And so often when you try to connect a new device, it says, oh, this is a smart speaker or, oh, this is a mouse, right? Um, and so the types of messages that can be sent out are standardized as part of Bluetooth. So you have this core specification, and then on top of that, you can send, or, or within that, you can send messages that are for controlling a phone, um, for, tro for controlling a um, video or audio. Like for example, these, are, these, would be, these would define messages to do things like play, stop, skip. Right, that those messages are kind of defined and standardized so that if you are implementing a speaker well, then you probably want to accept messages such as play and stop. And so um, you basically conform to this protocol and then your phone conforms to this protocol. And so, um, you know, you don't need to kind of deploy, someone doesn't need to write an application for your particular phone and the particular device, they can interact through these standard messages. Okay. So it's a little bit different than the stuff we talked about before in that the Bluetooth protocol doesn't just specify means to transmit data packets, but there are also specific data packets um, that um, control the activity or actions of particular devices that can be Bluetooth devices. And this idea comes... Um, well, actually, I don't know where it comes from specifically, but um, potentially it comes from military networks. I have a, a few slides on that. I don't think we'll get to those today, where um, military data links define basically all types of messages that can be transmitted through them. Um, it's a way of standardizing um, hardware interfaces. Uh, let's see, one more thing I want to talk about. Oh, so this Bluetooth stack can get quite complicated. Um, there was an, an issue... Oh, this was, I guess, almost a couple of years ago where um, Apple um, defined or had an update and it changed how um, one of these things worked or, or basically did it wrong. I don't quite remember the very details of it, but um, there was an update in the OS and it broke some of the Bluetooth. Um, it, it, it didn't work as uh, the protocol defined it, which basically prevented many bluetooth devices from working correctly with apple if they used a particular portion of this protocol uh, and so one of my friends uh led a campaign to get apple to fix this because the app he was working on for a company did not work anymore and uh i mean he's one of the he's one of the brightest people i know and <laughs> he uh actually finally got invited by apple to go into their headquarters and tell their um uh engineers how to fix it so kind of a cool story of, of, of breaching the Apple wall as a lowly non-Apple developer. Um, all right, so um, there are other types of protocols, for example, ZigBee, which are used for specifically low power communications. Okay? The, idea, the idea there is that you have some set of devices and they have 
you know, they're small, they're kind of dumb, maybe, maybe they're sensors and they have very limited power. You want them to have long lifetime or time between recharging. And so you need a very um, low uh, power expenditure for network connectivity. So um, Zigbee defines a different type of network where um, there is no master, but there is mesh connectivity. Um, and we could ask, how does that reduce communication power? Anybody? Any thoughts? So by not designating one node as the master, you basically can have direct transmissions between pairs of nodes. And so uh, no one has to take the action of relaying unless you really have kind of a bigger network. Um, and it has these full function devices and reduced function devices. Um, that doesn't terribly matter. What's, what's really important about Zigbee is this idea of um, uh, inactive periods in transmission. And so a full power device would um, transmit a, a beacon, which would kind of announce a super frame. Okay? In that super frame, you, could, you basically have some number of contention slots um, in which you can kind of reserve a transmission on a guaranteed slot. Okay? Um, and then you have guaranteed slots for data transmission. And then you have a, a very long, in comparison, inactive period where no one is transmitting. And so everybody can go to sleep. So once you get your, uh, if you're a, not a full function device, you can kind of find yourself a, a slot and then basically listen for the beacon, go to sleep, transmit data in your slot, go to sleep until kind of whenever you think the next beacon will be coming up. And so it allows you to power down your radio. You're not going to be able to transmit a lot of data, but uh, maybe you don't need to transmit a lot of data. Um, you know, there's different channels in this that kind of defined uh, uh, how quickly data can be transmitted. Um, there are beacons and acknowledgements, so an acknowledgement would come in the next frame. Um, and as I mentioned, there are guaranteed time slots. Okay. Um, but all these protocols, or a lot of these protocols, worked in the unlicensed band of 2.4 or 5.8 gigahertz. So I was at a conference a few years ago and there was a pretty cool project um, called Weeby. Um, and the idea there was to emulate Zigbee using Wi-Fi transmissions. So you have a Wi-Fi radio that transmits with 2.4. And even though that hardware doesn't speak uh, Zigbee, you can still use it to transmit Zigbee signals. It's kind of it's kind of magical. So if you have a Zigbee light bulb, normally you would connect through Wi-Fi from your phone to uh, some sort of hub, and then that hub would issue Zigbee signals. And what these people wanted to see is if you could control a light bulb directly from the phone, even though the phone doesn't have a Zigbee radio. Okay. And so um, what they did is basically there's a lot of uh, kind of wireless magic here, but what you basically wanted to do is send particular transmission on 2.4 gigahertz that would be interpreted by Zigbee and then to do it using a Wi-Fi radio. And so this is kind of your uh, uh, desired transmission and you're trying to kind of emulate it using a Wi-Fi transmission uh, simply by controlling Wi-Fi hardware. The idea there is basically... Uh, to get someone to... Have you guys seen Princess Bride? Does anyone remember that movie? Okay, so you have Andre the Giant. And Andre the Giant didn't speak English for that movie. So everything he says, he basically learned to say phonetically. So you can teach someone to kind of say the noises for English and someone else could interpret that in English even though the speaker doesn't really understand what they're saying. And so that's the idea and then they had a demo. So, I don't know, it's kind of like a niche quirky thing, but I thought it was fun to share it with you guys. I kind of like how assemblies like that translation uh, language as well. How so? Oh, just because, you know, certain languages can't read straight binary and then 
um, assembly and some other languages are used to interpret basically? I don't know that that's quite the right analogy, um, but it it would kind of be like, well, hardware really runs on, on, on binary, right? So if you could kind of use, uh, if you could use assembly uh, to, that would be kind of nonsensical, but when you translate it to, uh, when you translated it to machine code, that machine code could be used on another machine as if it was generated from another assembly. Right? Because ultimately what you're just controlling is bit sequences that are interpreted as machine code. If that helps. All right, so next we have another application, um, which is uh, near field communications, or I guess that's the solution to it. And the idea is to um, transmit data on very, very short range to provide privacy. And, and so um, uh, the kind of transmission there are in, in induction, like it uses electromagnetic induction patterns uh, between two loop antennas. So I guess this is another type of physical layer that I haven't mentioned uh, before. And um, you basically put an induction antenna on the phone, an induction antenna on the receiving device, and they can communicate, but that communication range is, is very, very short. Um, you don't need to transmit a lot of bandwidth. Um, you're transmitting ba basically a little bit of information um, just to identify a, an NFC tag or a credit card, very, very kind of limited information, um, but you want to do it in a privacy preserving way. Okay. So your NFC device or your smartphone can um, emulate an NFC card, um, which is something like this. You can basically glue it to something. You can hang it on something. It's just a little antenna that, that emits a particular bit pattern. Um, your phone can read those cards as well. So you can walk up to a device and if it's an NFC tag, you can read it with your phone. Um, or you can have this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication, which uh, allows kind of two phones, maybe, you know, when you, when you slap it together to exchange contact information. Okay. Um, on the other end of the spectrum of solutions, you have something called um, LoRa, which stands for long range. And it's a relatively new model. I think they uh, kind of came up with that. Uh, oh, I don't want to say like maybe seven years ago. It's, it's fairly recent. Okay. And it's a different way of um, modulating spectrum, and it's called chirps, chirp spread spectrum, or CSS. Okay. Um, the idea in LoRa is to uh, transmit data at a progress progressively um, increasing frequency. Okay? So you can think of like a sound that goes from a low sound to a high sound uh, pretty smoothly. Um, and what this does is if you kind of graph this on a, on a, on a spectrograph, um, you see a, I think this image might be flipped, but it doesn't matter. Let's just say you have a, a decreasing frequency here, okay? So you're starting from a high frequency and you're going to a low frequency, okay? So um, at some point, the frequency stops and you start a, uh, a, a new transmission after some time, okay? So you can basically look at the angle of this, look at when this started or kind of from which frequency this started and see where there's a crossover point to a frequency that's sufficiently higher here you can say, okay, this intercept was at this height, okay? Um, you can start a transmission here, which then uh, kind of continues, right? Because you run out of, uh, uh, you kind of go to the bottom and then you start from the top and then this is the intercept. And then you can start here, you reach the bottom, you start from the top and then here's the intercept, okay? So you can kind of find these intercept points and based on their height, um, you can extract the signal from it. Okay, so you're encoding bits basically by the height of the intercept. Right? Now, this is, has some really, really nice uh, properties. Um, for example, you can, uh, there's a lot of redundancy encoded in this. So even if you kind of can figure out only a part of this transmission, 
you can figure out the angle of this and, and where it's going to intersect. Okay? Which makes this really, really resistant to interference, uh, resistant to multipath fading. Um, it's resistant to Doppler effect. So even if the frequency stretches out, you can still figure out the intercept because it's based on the angle. Um, and so you can create these very, very long ranges uh, from single uh, antennas. Right? I mean, you can see these are kind of cities in Belgium and you can see what type of coverage you can get on that. This is simulation based, but still you can basically, you can very easily get ranges of um, 10 to 30 miles. This is something we've, we've run in the lab. Um, is this related? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was Go just ahead. gonna say, is this related then to Loran, um, which is a long range navigation? We used it in search and rescue and I was just it sounds really similar to this. Not that I know of, but perhaps um you may know more than I do on this. Um so there is there is Laura Wan, which is kind of an IoT solution based on this. Um but yeah, uh, let's see what else I want to say. Yeah, so you get kind of um, relatively low low uh, bandwidth on this. You get 50 channels of 10.9 kilobits per second, but for many applications, that's, that's quite enough. And you can actually uh, push voice through it. That's some of the research I've been doing with a company called Beartooth here um, in town where they build this kind of device that pairs with your phone using Bluetooth, and then you have connection um, between different um, bare tooth radios over LoRa links. And so this is still kind of uh, stuff I'm working on. If you're interested in uh, learning more about it, and I'm happy to chat with you guys. Okay. Um, questions about wireless, about any of these IoT solutions? There's plenty more. There's many different solutions out there. Some of them are meshed, some of them are are not, I just kind of covered some um, kind of basic approaches to this, but um, there's many, many more solutions you can come across. Anyone know of a particular um, uh, wireless link that's interesting that they know something about? Maybe you guys worked with it before? Sure, I mean, I could elaborate on Loran a little bit. Um, yeah, tell us more. So it's, uh... I actually post a link to the wiki page if you wanted, but it's an old school. It's been around since World War II, and essentially um, it's this extremely long range radio signal. Um, and we have towers all over the world um, and like international cooperation on this, where basically mm -hmm. the signals we monitor where they intersect. Um, mm -hmm. And then we can like identify locations of vessels and anything else using um, on the radio waves and stuff like that. Um, mm. So it's uh it's crazy the distance you can get off off of a tower. I think it was like I think they had it at like fifteen hundred miles or some. Um, so, anyways, wow. I, I used to monitor one of the stations out in Washington. So oh cool, I, it looks like it uses microwaves. I'm just reading about it. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know a lot of the technical side of it, but I had to monitor one of the stations for I don't know, like three years. So that's cool. Uh, but it's it's pretty neat too because like uh, the new systems and stuff like that too. If there's any sort of radio transmission, you'll just see them like ping on a map where like we had a little digital map and it would just uh -huh. show exactly where they crossed over. And it was it's kind of cool. If you have a lot of towers, of course, it's even more accurate because then you just have multiple points. Um, so, anyways, right? Pretty neat technology. It's been around for a while. So, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it looks like it uses. Uh... 1.85 and 1.95 megahertz, which are uh, pretty long waves. That would, that would explain the range. Um, that's cool. Yeah, there's a lot of radio technologies out there, um, right? We've seen kind of the spectrum, um, and it's taken up mostly by non kind of commercial communications, right? So all these different radio spectrums use some technology. Cool. Um, all right. Let me throw me out. Okay. So, all right. So next I want to talk about um, kind of mobility in wireless networks. That's one of the advantages of it is that you can change your location because you're not tethered with a wire. Okay. So um, 
you can think of mobility in a number of ways and there would be different solutions to kind of cater to each one of them. Right? One is to simply move within the same wireless network. This would be you taking your laptop from one desk and moving it onto another without changing the association with an access point, right? That's already pretty cool, but it, it's not that hard to do, right? From the network protocol perspective, you still have the same association. Okay? The other possibility is you can move between access networks while shutting down your connectivity. Okay, you put your laptop to sleep, you move somewhere else, you open it up. Okay, well, that's a little bit harder because now you need to appear in the new network, perhaps as you appeared in the old network, or at least have be able to access it, right? So that's a little bit more work that has to get done on the protocol side. And then the other idea is to move between networks, between access points, while maintaining connectivity seamlessly, where you don't even know that you're doing a transmission, uh, a, a, a handover between one access point or one tower and another, right? So th this is the level of mobility you uh, often have kind of in, in Wi-Fi networks. Right, where there is an expectation that if you change access points, you might notice it or you might need to reconnect. Um, and then in uh, cellular networks, we kind of expect this seamless mobility, seamless handover, where you can continue your conversation even though you're driving your car between different um, cell towers. Right, This is also often used in, uh, can be used in satellite communications in the, in the military. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, how important is it for a user to keep their IP address as, as they move between access points? What would happen if you didn't keep your IP address? Uh, some of the issues that I've seen working um, in IT with varying IP addresses is doing like remote desktop connections and things like that. You can't reach, um, say like if I'm trying to remote desktop in from my house to work, my mm -hmm. IP address has changed and I can't reach that that particular desktop. It could be somebody else's. Um, right. So that, that was one of the big reasons why we implemented uh, DNS was so we could mm -hmm. reach those. So we could just type mm -hmm. in a name and no matter where it was, we could reach it. But um, yeah, I think that was one of the big reasons why I think IP address is important to like. Right. Know. So an IP, an IP address doesn't make for a great node ID, right? Because IP addresses right. can change, so you still would want something more permanent than that to, to, to reach a particular node. Um, any other concerns with losing your IP address as you move around? Well, if it's cached and you're in the middle of transmitting, it might transmit some of that data to the wrong IP address, more or less. Right, so if you're transmitting to an IP, and then that IP is no longer there, your TCP connection would, would basically time out. Right? So then you would have to reestablish it. Not great, not convenient. Okay. Um, so how could you maintain a connection to an application even though you might be changing your IP as you move between networks? Um, or alternatively, would it make sense to keep your IP as you uh, move around the internet, and those are kind of different options. So um, what would happen if you did get to keep your IP forever? Why would that break the internet? Because there's not enough IP addresses for everyone to keep their own uh, and have it be unique for everyone. Um, that's certainly one of the problems. Yes, very good. We need to kind of reuse IP addresses. But what um, if there were IPv6, right? Like, if right. Had, yeah. What if there were not? I almost feel like you could exploit that somewhat. Like you could learn somebody's IP address and just like keep using that or spam it or do something. I don't know. It feels There's like a... malicious. There's a more there's a more uh, kind of performance driven problem. Well, the global routing tables would be significantly larger and significantly Very good more title. difficult to maintain. Very good, exactly. So that makes sense. Everybody got to keep their IP address. You would end up with many many different IP addresses in a particular network, and so it would be very difficult to to um, aggregate destinations using an IP prefix. 
which would basically explode the size of routing tables and uh, make them unmanageable. Okay, so turns out that we have a uh, solution to, this, to these problems um, that has been designed even though it's kind of not used as designed. So uh, what I told you guys is that there are uh, these five layers in the, in the stack, okay? Um, where application is layer seven and transport is uh, layer four, right? Sometimes we talk about layer three or layer two solutions, right? So what happens to these other layers between application and transport? Well, these are basically presentation and session. Um, presentation is a, a way of presenting data to the application in a unified way. That's definitely not used, um, but the address we're talking about um, the, the issue we're talking about here is solved by the session layer where your connection, the connection between hosts is identified by a particular session number, not an IP and port. So you can switch your IP and reestablish a transport connection and those would simply hook up to the same session which the application is connected to, right? Now, we tend to write from the application directly to the transport layer, right? The, these protocols are really not used anymore, but the ideas from there have been moved into the application layer so that your application can move from one place to another, establish a new transport connection and say, yep, still me, and then kind of keep going from where you left off. Okay? So these ideas are basically implemented by the application and so they're not kind of used as standardized. Uh, okay, so that's as far as kind of maintaining your uh, identity as you move, but what if you have a kind of a streaming application where you wanted to keep receiving data as you move around? And, and the solution to there is analogous to you, to you trying to receive data or, or receive mail, excuse me, um, when you, for example, move from your home address to college, right? Your parents might still hold on to your mail and give it to you when you're um, within reach, right? Or in some cases, even mail it over to you, okay? And this is where mobile IP comes in. So let's say that we have a conversation between what we're gonna call correspondent and you. And so normally that, uh, the packets for the data would go through some network to your IP address, okay? And what might happen is that you end up moving to a different network, okay? Where your permanent address is still this, but you are in a different subnet with these IP addresses. And so you might get a care of address where your address in this network is actually that. Okay. There are then the home agent and a foreign agent which enable this protocol. So the packets would go from the correspondent to the correspondent keeps sending it to your old IP address. Those packets are routed to your home agent. Your home agent says, oh, this person is no longer here. In fact, I know that they're over here. And so I'm going to forward these packets to the care of address which makes those packets arrive at the foreign agent and the foreign agent that says, okay, cool. I'll forward those to the mobile node. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, okay. my mic is, on. is this kind of similar to um, like incognito mode or anything like that? Or is that like a, cause I know that kind of pings all over the place to kind of. No, that's a different, that's a different issue. This is, this is simply to, um, allow you to allow you to move to a different subnet without breaking your TCP connection, which is based on IP. And so it's a way, kind of a different way for letting IP connection survive uh, you moving out of a particular subnet. Okay. Right. Yep, cool. So we have this thing. We move to a new um, to a new network and um, this is my mobile address, which is kind of what it used to be in the old network, okay? Now, I'm waiting here. I'm kind of speaking the mobile IP protocol, and I'm waiting for an announcement from the foreign agent in the new network 
um, which will be advertised using IC, uh, uh, ICMP. Cool, great. I get that and I send the registration request saying that my uh, care of address is the address of the foreign agent. That's who's going to kind of forward the packets to me. That's my public facing IP address now. Um, my home agent is this, and I need to know it kind of before I move. Uh, my mobile address is this, which is my old IP address, and then, you know, lifetime identification, other things like that. So that request goes to the foreign agent. The foreign agent looks up the home address in here, sends that registration request to the home agent. The home agent says, cool, looks like there's a care of address here. And now it sends a registration reply to that care of address. The foreign agent receives that and says, okay, cool. Now we have a link. It uh, sends a registration reply to the mobile agent so that mobile agent knows that it's registered, doesn't have to keep trying to register itself. Okay, pretty simple. At the end of this, uh, the home agent knows the care of address for that particular node, and the foreign agent knows that there is this mobile agent connected to it. Um, great. Okay. So the way this communication would then work is there would be a message from the correspondent to the home agent, which is then forwarded to the for, uh, foreign agent, which is then forwarded to the mobile node, and the mobile node can de reply directly to the correspondent. The correspondent sends data to this node's permanent address, okay? And the mobile node can simply reply to the correspondent's IP address using its source address, but that's fine because packets are routed based on destination address. And so the, you know, the routing system from here to there would deliver messages to this IP address, okay? The question might be, what do the packets look like on each of the links, okay? So here we have a transmission from home agent. So the, the first packet would be simply a transmission from this IP address to this IP address. That gets to the home agent. The home agent takes the packet and transmits it to the care of address, okay? Foreign agent receives that bundle, unbundles the packet, and now forwards it to this mobile node. The question is, how does it do it? Because this mobile, this IP address doesn't really have any meaning in this network. But if this is a switched network, the foreign agent can simply send this IP packet to the MAC address of this mobile node. Right? It doesn't matter what the link layer address is, as long as we're just forwarding it to a particular MAC address. How does the foreign agent know the MAC address of the node? From the registration process, right? When, when foreign agent receives this registration request, it can also look at the MAC address that it came from. Okay. And then the reply comes from the, goes from the mobile node simply to this um, IP address. Okay. The obvious inefficiency here is that we need to send the data kind of in this triangular way. Okay, So what we can do is kind of shortcut this by having the corresponding agent talk to the home agent to figure out, um, hey, what is the care of address? Oh, it's this foreign agent. Great. I'm just going to send packets directly to it. Okay. So I think we can um, end here. I'll kind of pick up some of this lecture and uh, finish wireless next time. But that's basically uh, mobile IP. All right, any last minute questions? Yeah, I was kind of a... Yeah, oh, go you, ahead, go, you go first. You go first, Justin. Mine's just for fun. Justin, go. <laughs> kind, of, kind of the same. Uh, I was just curious, are we going to go over like onion routing at all? Uh, what routing? Onion routing, like Tor browsers and things like that, and how those those work. Yes. Okay. Cool. Those are interesting. Yep. My question was just uh, furthering on incognito. Um, if you have any idea of like how they actually pull that off. Um, the incognito mode in browsers. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, basically, like, like Google has an incognito mode, and I know there's a bunch of other ones that exist, but, uh, yeah, where they basically, like, hide your IP, and you just 
kind of go around uh, uh, so you don't get targeted ads and stuff like that towards you? I don't know what their proxy. So my guess is that they're using some proxy method. I'm not, I haven't read on this, so I don't know for a fact, but um, I know that the incognito mode will uh, kind of not um, expose any cookies that you have in your in your browser and, and, and not accept any, um, kind of delete them after the session. Um, as far as forwarding your traffic through a proxy to hide your IP, I'm not sure that they're actually doing that, but they could be. I need to read about that more. I know there are certain ones that do, um, and people because people use them all the time just for, I guess, security reasons. It's really hard to know who's doing what. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just curious because I've always been a little bit. I just wondered how they did that because. Uh, yeah, it just seems interesting. I honestly go in incognito mode all the time to uh, read news because otherwise it likes to try and form the news to what I would want to read, but that's kind of besides the point. So interesting. Um, I will look in. I will research this if there's anything to incognito mode other than just browser um, not saving stuff. That would be interesting. Um, yeah, no. I, was, I would also be concerned. I don't want Google likes forwarding my data. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, that was the weirdest part was when uh, Google got, because it was originally, um, it was an independent group that was doing it. Not not like anonymous independent, but like kind of similar. There's like internet vigilantes that don't like them reading our data. And so yeah. they basically formed this whole thing just to kind of like give them the finger and be like, how are you going to track us now? So um, anyways, I, I know that much about it. I just don't know any of the technical aspect. So. Uh, well, we'll definitely talk about uh, Tor onion router, um, but I will I will look into incognito mode for that lecture. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a good weekend. See you later. Thanks. You too.